Hi everyone, this is Kirsten Davis at Stetson University College of Law and I'm happy to have you all here for our uh, webinar on the pedagogical method of live grading and commenting. Uh, here I am, uh, your, your moderator for the day in, in what turns out to be a sunny day here in Florida. And I just want to start by having you all let me know that you can hear me uh, by testing your question and answer box on your control panel, which is probably on the right-hand side of your screen. You can see a box that says questions, and then a little box where you can type in a question to me, your organizer and moderator. So if you would, just go ahead and give me a typing in there and let me know that you can hear us. Fabulous. Lots of you can hear me. Thank you. Uh, that's really helpful. I always worry that I'm talking into the into the abyss and someone wishes they were here in Florida with me. I'm, that would be great. Come on down and join us. Uh, just to give you a quick tour of your interface before we get started, uh, this is what you're probably seeing more or less on your screen. Uh, your viewer window is likely on the left. Your control panel is over here on the right, and there's not a whole lot for you to know, uh, so, but just let me quickly say what you might want to know. That little carrot there that the red arrow is pointing to can open and close that control panel, so if you want to scooch it out of the way, you can, but just by clicking on it, it'll close that control panel, and clicking on it again will open it back up, so that's what you would want to do there. If you have any issues with your audio, this is where you would go in to kind of play around with your volume or any kind of other controls that you were having issues with. And when you want to ask me a question or ask our panelists a question, this is where you're going to type the question in. And at the end of our session, uh, we'll have a question and answer period. So as you think of questions, don't hesitate. Just type them right into that box, which is right there. Um, sometimes this control panel will hide itself, so if you go up to this little view button right here, when you click, you should get a little window that shows you auto hide the control panel. If that's checked, after 10 minutes or so, your control panel will hide itself. If you're worried about that, just unclick that and then it'll stay open and your question and answer box will stay open too. Just to let you know, um, our webinars, all of them, are available for replay. And if you want to go to our new legal writing website uh, and you click on this link that I'm highlighting right here, uh, you can get all of our webinars just by registering for, for free, uh, our Advocacy Resource Center, and they appear there. Uh, I believe all of them are up now. We were having some challenges with that, but they're all there now. This one will be there too, and so feel free to, to listen to any old ones or refer other people there to listen to them. So uh, we're ready to move on today to today's topic, which I think is an exciting one um, about uh, live grading and live critiquing, which has been an emerging yet somewhat controversial topic for us in the in the legal uh, writing and legal methods community. And so I've, I've gotten together a group of people who I think are, are advocates of, of the process, have used it quite a bit, um, but, are, but are also very mindful of its limitations and challenges to talk with you today um, about, about this process. Uh, Allison Julian is a professor of legal writing at Marquette University Law School, and many of you may have heard her uh, talk before uh, on this topic at uh, LWI conferences and she's written as well on the topic of live critiquing. Jason Palmer is my colleague here. He is an associate professor of legal skills uh, who has been a tremendous advocate here of the method and has really developed some unique approaches himself uh, in the area and has spoken on the topic at other conferences. And finally, joining us from Chicago is Mark Wojcik, who is a professor of law at John Marshall Law School and, again, a frequent uh, speaker and writer on the issue of live, content, uh, live commenting. And for him, a particular area of emphasis is live critiquing. Um, and so what I'm going to do now is share the uh, screen with Mark, who's going to get us started with a bit of an overview. Um, and from there, we'll hear from all of our panelists on uh, critiquing and grading uh, in, in order, and they'll be sharing their thoughts with us. Um, so Mark, I'm going to go ahead and share the screen with you. Is that okay? That's great, Kirsten. Uh, Thank you very much. Okay. Um, Just give me one second. and. 
you should have it coming your way about now. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. I'm really glad to be um, participating in this uh, in, in this uh, session here. And uh, I uh, actually, my my uh, interest is in live grading because I've been doing this maybe 14 or 15 years now, and it's really changed how I approach teaching and interacting with students, and I find it to be a tremendously valuable and useful pedagogical tool. I first learned it from... Mark, uh, can, I, can I interrupt you just a second? We're not seeing your screen, so I think you need to go ahead and click on the button that says accept my screen. Uh, there we go. We can see it now. Okay. Um, thanks. Uh, I first learned this from, from Joe Kimball at Thomas Cooley at an LWI conference um, back sometime in the last century uh, when he was uh, facing a situation where he had up to 75 students and he just didn't have time to grade all of these papers and to do the written comments on there. And he was using this technique and it's, it's not unique to legal writing. A lot of uh, college uh, professors do this in writing courses as well, and a lot of our students actually have experienced live grading and live critiquing in their undergraduate. But uh, Joe was was showing me how to do this, and I decided to give it a try. And oh my God, it it absolutely changed my life in how I approached uh, commenting and grading on papers, how I was interacting with the students, and how I could see the students uh, reacting to it. So what we're going to talk about today, the three of us, is uh, live grading and live critiquing, and the differences between there. Uh, we know that uh, uh, we have uh, a lot of students. We have at least um, 25 students. Maybe uh, in, in in some schools there's a little bit less this this year with the down downer uh, lower enroll enrollments, but. We have at least 25, sometimes 35, 45, but some professors have had 50 or even 75 students in a single session. And the students might be writing one, two, three, four papers that have to be graded each semester. And grading and commenting in the traditional way of reading these, uh, writing your comments, writing thoughtful end comments, and all the way through could take an hour or two for each paper, sometimes three or four in those really bad papers. So it's it's really uh, what I'm calling the grading crush of, of uh, the legal writing thing. Uh, there, there's a joke among a lot of professors that, you know, if we didn't have to grade, I would just do this job for free and uh, do it. They just pay me for grading. But here's what the, the grading crush is. We also have a conference crush because after we do those graded papers, we give them back to the students and the students will come and have uh, paper conferences with us. Some Professors will have uh, research conferences even before that where the students will come in and present their, their research that they're going to use in a particular case. Um, some professors will meet with students to discuss drafts of the paper, and then when they get the papers back, they'll have paper conferences. And these paper conferences and all of these, these conferences take up a great amount of time during the semester. We are constantly meeting with students, and that's why we're teachers, but it takes a tremendous amount of time. So we have this grading crush and this conference crush, which leads to one busy semester for all of us. And we, uh, the three of us, have figured out a way of, of dealing with this. And uh, my colleagues, Allison Julian and Jason Palmer, are now going to share their experiences on live critiquing. And I'll be back after that with more thoughts on live grading. But before we do that, we want to ask you a question about whether you are most interested in, in live grading, in live critiquing, or both, or or you're not sure. So I will put this back to uh, Kirsten. Oh, great. Um, so I've actually done a little poll to, to work on my 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 polling uh, ability on this uh, software. And so you can just click and answer um, this question. And, and I phrased it a little differently, sorry, Mark. Which, which do you anticipate you'll likely use in your course, grading, critiquing both of these, or not sure if either one of these would work in my course? Just to, just to get a sense of, of where you are. So I see, great job, you're all answering. And in just a moment, I will close the poll and share it with you. So our, our um, OK, so here we go. I'm going to close the poll. 
share it with all of you. Look at this, I'm getting much better at this. Uh, so about half of you might use both of these. A, a few of you are not sure, and, and a good solid of almost 40% will try to use live, maybe could use live critiquing. Great. Well, that then leads us to um, Allison and Jason. Uh, I believe Allison's going to talk with us first. Is that right, Allison, about your, right. your method of live critiquing? So let me share the screen with you. And... It should be on its way. Am I up? OK. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. It's the morning where I am. Um, I'm going to talk to you first about what I call the live critique, which is different from live grading, just in that I don't actually assign a letter grade on the things that I uh, critique. So first, let me give you a little bit about my process. Um, that's the table where I sit and do all of my live critiques. You can see that I have a keyboard for me and one for the students um, so that we can work collaboratively. Um, I have all of my papers come in via TWIN on the evening before my conference. Um, I used to have all my papers come in about two weeks before conference week, and I would put copious comments on all of them, um, and then do 20-minute conferences. Um, now they all come in the evening before the students are coming in for the conference. So that means I have four to six papers, depending on the day, to skim um, during that evening. So I do skim them. I don't make any lengthy comments on them, though I might make a couple of comments to jog my memory about something that I think is important to talk to the student about. Um, and then the students come in for conferences the next day, not having seen any comments on their papers yet. Um, they sit down, um, I ask them right from the get-go if they have any particular questions. If they do, we'll jump in there. If they don't, um, I just start reading. So I do read the papers out loud. Um, I ask questions uh, or make comments as I go. Students ask questions. Um, I encourage them to do that and make suggestions and make their own comments as we go. Uh, we both take notes, either on the computer or um, they often take notes on a hard copy. Um, is, despite the fact that they claim to be completely paperless, um, I found that they are more reluctant to make comments electronically, at least in the first conference in the semester. At the end of the conference, they leave with um, the paper that has a number of comments from me in the margins and maybe some uh, line edits that we did together. Um, and then I also fill out a short rubric at the end so that they have sort of my overall global impressions. Um, I give them hard copies of both of those things. And then also, um, I post them back to TWIN. Um, and then the student revises the paper and turns in the final version. And those final papers, I actually um, grade in the traditional way with just a written critique. So in terms of benefits, I feel like um, I'm better prepared for these conferences, not because I didn't prepare for them originally, but when I was reading 40-some papers over two weeks, I tended to read them in the order of the conferences. So by the time I got to the first day of conferences, I had critiqued those papers about two weeks prior. And because they're all about the same thing, I often didn't have any real detailed memory of any given paper by the time the students came in. And I had to use the comments to jog my memory. Now, um, all the papers are fresh to me when the students come in because I've read them just the night before. Um, there's also no dead time for students. Um, my best students tended to keep working on their briefs between the times they turned in their drafts and the times we met for conferences, which was fantastic because that's what I wanted them to do. But when they got the comments back two weeks later, it was often sort of wasted time on my part because they had already changed substantially their papers by the time they got them back. And then we were left with what was essentially a live critique anyway, but with far less time to do it. I also think my relationships have improved with my students. I had good relationships with them to begin with, but I found that um, sometimes they would come in sort of feeling defensive. Um, I think that there can be a problem with tone with written comments, just like there can be a, a problem with tone in an email. Um, I never try to make snarky or sarcastic comments, as I'm sure we, none of us do. Um, and I always tried hard to include positive comments as well as critical ones, but students always seem to focus on the negative and not the positive, and they would often come in feeling defensive or defeated when they had read my comments before the conference because they, they just didn't somehow notice the positive ones. Now we talk through the comments as I make them, and the students can hear my tone as we work together, and they can see that um, 
I'm really working with them collaboratively, collaboratively and just trying to help them improve their writing. And it makes for a more positive and collaborative experience altogether. I can also make less detailed comments. Uh, I will admit that my comments are still pretty detailed. Um, but because as we talk through them, as I make them, um, I don't need quite as much detail to make the point clear. And often the student will jump in and say, could you just write this word or that word, and that'll jog my memory. Um, also, because I read out loud, I found that students can often hear a problem as I read, and I don't need to point it out. They can identify awkward or confusing phrasing or overly long sentences, or um, they can even sometimes hear a topic shift in a paragraph that they didn't see when they were just reading. Um, and also, I can help the students by the way in which I read the, pa the passage. So if I get to a paragraph that's one big long sentence, I take a deep breath and I read the whole thing without a pause. Um, and they can hear that that's not workable. Um, or if I find a passage that's confusing, I can read it and just pause at the end. And usually the student will look at me and hear the pause and understand that I was confused by something and jump in and, and work to explain it. I think the most important point for me is that I no longer guess at meaning. And that was the most frustrating thing for me when I was grading drafts before. I often found myself writing comments that said something like, it looks like you're trying to do this here. But if you were, it didn't work, and probably because of this reason. Um, and try to do this to fix it. But if I was incorrect at the very beginning about what the student was trying to accomplish, the entire comment was a wasted effort. And the student would come in and say, well, no, that's not really what I was trying to do. And so I had spent all of that time and effort um, doing something that wasn't productive for the student. Now I just say, I'm not sure what you were trying to accomplish in that paragraph. Um, can you help me? And we go from there. We may draft a thesis together or um, move some things around. And finally, I think students better understand a reader's needs. If they watch me work my way through the paper, they can see firsthand what trips me up um, and what makes my life easier as a reader. Um, they can tell that transitions and really solid thesis sentences help me get through more detailed um, explanations that follow. Um, they can see that imprecise or missing transitions or um, bad thesis sentences that are too fact-based or are redundant stop me. Um, and make me go back and try to figure out where I am. So I think they get a better feel for how their writing affects the reader. So those are what I would consider the main benefits. There are certainly drawbacks, as there are, I think, with any method. Um, I do think there are probably some students who process information more slowly and might benefit from a written critique before the conference. But for what it's worth, I've never had a student ask for comments before the conference or um, complain about the method, either to me or in my evaluation. Um, yet I do imagine that some students benefit from digesting the comments ahead of time. Um, also, some legal writing professors may need more time to process the writing and make comments um, rather than doing it live. I don't think I would have been great at this method during my first few years of teaching because it took me a while to figure out how to diagnose what it was that I was seeing and make a comment that was responsive. Um, I was about five years in, I think, when I started doing this, and I was able to do it then. It's easier for the first couple of times if you're working with a problem that you've done before um, so that you have a better sense of what you might see. Um, also, I don't get to read all of the students' papers before I begin the conferences, and I found that helpful in the old method that I used so that I had a sense of what the common problems were. Um, but even with just reading four to six papers the first night, I still get a, a sense of where students are going to struggle. Um, so that hasn't been a big problem, but it is a, a slight drawback. Um, I also have to cancel more classes to make room for conferences. My conferences are 45 minutes to an hour. Um, so I really haven't decreased the amount of time I spend critiquing and conferencing, but I've reallocated the time. I used to spend about an hour or more critiquing and 20 minutes conferencing, and now I flip them and I spend maybe 20 minutes skimming and making a few comments and an hour during the conference. And I think that allocation has been more helpful in a way that I think justifies canceling the classes. I also try to schedule some of the library lectures during those conference weeks. And I use a lot of webcasts for um, topics like citation or um, sentence structure, grammar, those kinds of things. And I assign a lot of those webcasts during conference weeks to make up for some of that time. Um, I can only cover about six or eight six to eight pages in an hour-long conference, particularly in the very first conference. But I don't tend to assign much longer briefs anyway. Mine usually have a 10 or 12 page limit. And 
Um, I generally read just the argument section in a live conference, so if we have time, I'm happy to read the other pieces as well. But for those of you who do long appellate briefs, um, you may have to think about whether you want to cover the whole thing or whether you want to cover um, a smaller portion. And then I don't um, assign grades. I have a curve that I need to comply with, and it just takes me a while to figure out where that curve is going to shake out. So. Um, I don't assign grades. I, I, I'm going to listen carefully again to Mark and see if he can tell me how that might work for me because I would love to be able to do that for final papers too. But for me, um, I haven't figured out a way to do that effectively in my system just yet. So um, those are the drawbacks. But again, um, I think the benefits so far outweigh the drawbacks that I've consistently um, stuck with this live grading system, at least for my drafts. Again, I, I don't do it for final papers, but I do live grades for each of my rough drafts. And that's it from me, so I will turn it over to Jason. Great. Well, thank you, Allison. Um, and so you heard Allison talk a little bit about uh, a method where she reads aloud uh, for uh, almost an hour for six to eight uh, pages, and I know Jason's method, I think, is a little different, and so he's going to um, share that with us now. Jason, I'm going to turn the screen over to you. Great. <laughs> okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen at, at this point. Um, I, I do agree with Allison, a lot of the things she said and a lot of the, the processes. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my approach to it, and again, I do live critiquing. I, I do not do live grading either. I don't. I do it at early stages of the writing process because I feel it's important to have that one-on-one -on -one contact with the student early on. I think the conference gives us an opportunity to sit down with the paper and really walk through the pieces of the analysis, the way the student's thinking, how they're putting that on the paper. Um, focusing on the structure and the organization of the paper. And I should start off with a caveat that some of this depends on whether you're teaching RNW1 or RNW2. I use live critiquing both in RNW1 and in RNW2 for my first written submission from the students, so their first um, argument section of a, persuasive, of a predictive memo or the first argument section of a persuasive memo. Um, both of those I, use, I limit it to 1,800 words. So it comes out to be roughly five or six pages, and I do 30 to 40 minute conferences. Um, RNW1, I'm focusing in the conference um, a lot on basic, are they getting the idea of um, rule synthesis? Do they have um, some idea of what the case explanations are? Are they used effective cases, uh, the cases effectively? Do they uh, start having some analogical reasoning and explain the analysis? Similar in the persuasive, RNW2, I'm focusing on some of the th same things, but we're also talking about structure and organization and style and persuasion. Um, and you can accomplish all these things, I think, in a conference when you have the students right there with you and you can actually look at the papers together. So I actually, when I get started, I actually sit down at a table in my office and I have a st the student bring a hard copy of the memo with him or her. I think it's um, helpful to have the student actually sit there and write on the memo. And we just don't write comments. We actually will work on actual parts of the memo together. We will rewrite topic sentences, rewrite rule synthesis, working on it together. So that we're actually developing some of those pieces of the document together, showing what worked effectively in their memo, what didn't work effectively in their memo. In order to do all that, it, it's really important to be comfortable with the problem. Um, as Allison said, you know, this is um, an area where you really need to understand the case law you're using, that you are comfortable with, um, the, um, with the case law, and that um, you're comfortable with sitting and talking about how the courts are analyzing the different factors in the cases. Um, I then say I skim the student memo prior to the conference. Um, I have actually done it both ways. Um, I've done where I've uh, skimmed the memo and I'm ready and I have some comments on it. I've also done it where there's a cold reading. We sit down both of us for the first time this semester. I actually did it that way because I scheduled all my conferences, believe it or not, this week, uh, last week actually, I did 36 conferences in four days um, while holding classes. So unlike Allison, I did not cancel my classes. I actually 
worked at the conferences in. And like I said, I did 30 to 40 minutes, so it made for very long days. But I think the benefit to that is that the student really does appreciate the immediate feedback. So the memos came in on Sunday. I started conferences and was done with those conferences by Friday. Um, so, and both ways work. If you're skimming them beforehand, again, it's to give yourself the ability to make notes about, well, you know, this is a weak synthesis or, you know, missing topic sentence so that you're keying yourself to ideas that you want to discuss with the student. Um, you can do that same objective by sitting down with the student at the table. So, when the student first comes in to my office, um, we sit down with the paper and the first thing I ask the student is, well, how'd it go? What did you think about the memo? What do you think, you know, how do you think you did? And I always get the response of, oh, it was okay, or, oh, it wasn't so bad, or, wow, it was a lot harder than I thought it was going to be. And um, I try to dig down on that a little bit. I say, well, what did you think was okay? What did you think you did uh, well? or what made it harder than you thought it was going to be? To try to get the student to start thinking about, well, I really struggled with structure, or I really didn't understand what the rules of the cases were, so I really couldn't get them down on the paper the right way. Or I really had a hard time using multiple cases to prove one part of the, of the analysis of the sub-issue. And I take notes on that as we're talking so that I can bring those ideas back as we're going through the conference. Um, and then I basically walk through the paper with the student. I start off by saying, and, and I, you know, I use TREAT as my paradigm, so TREAT being thesis, rule, explanation, application, thesis, conclusion. I know we all use different ones, but for me, I just like the students to think about theses and topic sentences and theories of their case, especially in persuasive writing. So I'll talk to them about, well, how did you start your memo? Did you start with a roadmap? And we look at the beginning if there's a strong thesis and a strong rule statement. And we basically walk through the parts of the memo um, step by step, talking about the different sections. We get to the first sub-issue. I say, do you have a topic sense to explain what the point of the paragraph is here? Do you go through and provide a sub-rule? What cases do you use to, to support that sub-rule? So we're actually walking through and, and in some respects really dissecting the memo. And then as we're talking, I have the student taking notes on his or her paper about what they need to do to edit or revise or change. And sometimes we even come up with um, sentences or paragraphs right there on the spot that will help them see how it should appropriately be um, written, how they can revise it, how it works all together. Um, so we'll go through that. Um, like Allison said, I don't even, with you know, having memos that are 1,800 words, always get through every part of the memo. But I do make sure to get through at least um, all my concepts that I want to cover. So I get through structure, organization. I make sure I get through um, talking about the, the roadmap or umbrella paragraphs, talking about at least one of the substantive issues of the memo, going through all the pieces of the substantive issue. So we talk about the rule synthesis, the explanation, the application. If we have time, we get through more. But then I say, okay, the concepts that we've covered here, they'll translate to the rest of the memo, and you can work through those concepts as you work through the rest of the memo. Uh, I do not, um, I only do this with the first memo, I do not do it, they then do a rewrite of that memo, like Allison on the rewrite, I do then give written comments back for the rewrite, um, again before they go into their final appellate brief for their final um, uh, objective predictive memo in the first semester, so that they have some written comments and the rubric that I provide also with my comments on it after the, the full rewrite. Um, so that's my process. The student reaction for this has been extraordinarily positive. Um, the feedback I get um, is, is, you know, the students inevitably ask me after the first conference, are we going to do this again for the second memo? Um, and again, because it is in, in, incredibly time intensive to set up all these conferences, it's hard to schedule 36 conferences in a week. Um, I do not do this for the second memo. I do tell them I will make individual appointments, which again, most of them then take advantage of. Um, but we talk about specific issues. But uh, I, I've never had a negative reaction to a student who didn't want to participate in this type of conference or didn't come in engaged and ready to talk about their memo. Sometimes it takes a little digging and you have to prod a little bit to get the student um, moving in the direction you want. But I, I asked students afterwards, and some of the comments I got 
are up on the screen. For those of us who learn by actively working through prompts, it was one of the better exercises I've done this semester. By doing a one-on-one -on -one conference with you, I was able to make the have the aha moment of realizing the mistakes I was making. And I find that's true with almost every single student. They are able to, better than just reading, reading my comments, I find that if I just write the comment on the paper, and I could say the same thing in writing on the paper that I say sitting at a table with them, and the same message isn't communicated. By actually saying it to them and having them work through it together, side by side, it seems to sink in. And that ties into that second comment that they just don't allow for that instant feedback. And you can see that the message is getting through. You can see that students are actually um, getting it where they might not. And you may be saying the same thing you've said in class, the same thing you'd write on a paper, but for some reason sitting there at the table, they're finally getting it. Um, and uh, most importantly, I think this third sum, it's not that one-way street of constructive criticism, that third comment, where I think some of our students um, view feedback and comments on the paper not as constructive criticism or a way to help them move forward, but it's actually they see you know, the, the pen on the side or the pencil marks or whatever, and they just in, immediately have that, that um, defensive reaction to what's written on the paper, whereas I've never had a single student uh, in a conference in the room with me act defensively or be defensive when we're talking, when we're having a conversation about the paper, as opposed to reading. Even when I had conferences after, when I gave them comments and they'd come in and we'd conference about the comments, um, there's already a, a predisposition to be um, unhappy with something written on the paper. Whereas if you sit down and you start talking about it without anything on the paper, they're more receptive to hearing what you have to say. Uh, Final thoughts on this, um, live critiquing does take time up front. I mean, there is some preparation time. And not only do I mean the preparation reading the papers, that you can choose to do or not, depending on how comfortable you are with the, with the assignment, but the preparation time in, in terms of really knowing the problem, knowing the ins and outs of the facts of the problem, how they're going to apply and work in your case, really being um, comfortable with the case law so you can discuss it. Um, so it, it does take time up front, but it also does save that time in the extensive comment, um, writing comments, um, which I find um, takes an inordinately long time. I got a new, a new iPad last semester, and I decided to play with it and put I annotate on the iPad and put all my memos on I annotate, and I was highlighting and commenting, and technology is wonderful, except I found that I was spending two hours on every single memo because I was having so much fun playing with all the different tools um, I, on, on I annotate. So um, the written comments can take a lot of time. Um, your students should take notes or write comments as you work through the memo. It's really important, I think, um, for the learning process to have them actually writing the comments. So I do not give back. If I'm writing on my memo and they're writing on theirs, I do not give back to the student what I've written on my memo, or my version of their memo. Um, I tell them up front, I'm not giving them anything back, that whatever they're walking out with is what they've written, aside from the rubric I give them, what they've written on their memo. So I expect them to take notes and, and to be active participants. Um, that being said, it doesn't completely replace written comments because I will do written comments. I do give some comments on a rubric I give them, and I do give them written comments on the rewrite, of the, you know, the, the second product they do turn in. Um, and then, like I said, each conference takes approximately 30 to 40 minutes. I try to stick to 30 minutes. I inevitably run over a little bit as I'm doing my final comments. but. Um, uh, again, I, I should learn better. I always plan 30 minutes um, per conference, and I probably should plan about 45 minutes per conference, realizing that I'll probably go 30 to 40, and it'll give me a little bit of transition time. Um, with that, I'll turn it back to um, Kirsten. Great, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, and so I, I want to quickly now, or not quickly, but promptly uh, turn to Mark Wojcik, who's going to cover the topic of live grading. And we're getting lots of good questions coming in, and I've been sorting them out. So when Mark is uh, done, we'll have some good questions uh, for you, panelists. Uh, Mark, I'm sending you the screen right now. Thank you. And, uh, and here we go, right? Yeah, I can see that, Mark. OK. Um, Thanks. I know some people also use recorded comments where they do the little uh, thing, the features on the, the papers where they uh, audio record comments into the papers. And, and that's basically what we're doing with live grading and live commenting, except we don't ever have to do a retake on it. It actually takes less time because we, we don't re-record our comments. We are sitting there with the students at the, the time. 
and uh, it's an efficient use of, of time. Uh, I'm using uh, live grading, and uh, a lot of the things that um, I'm doing really fall into this here, this, this pattern here. Uh, first, the, the student comes to my office. Um, I may or may not have looked at the paper before. If it's, um, if it's a problem that's familiar to me, uh, some intentional infliction of emotional distress or um, some uh, tort or contract issue that I've done for the past 10 or 20 years and I know the, the full range of uh, cases and uh, facts that will be written about, I, I won't uh, bother to skim them in advance, but if it's a new thing, I will uh, print them out. I might uh, do the blue booking in advance and check the sites. I want to be sure that I, I'm familiar with all of the cases they're going to cite. But, but a lot of times they just come in, I print out the paper here in my office, uh, and I work from a, a single printed copy of the paper. Um, I will go through the paper um, as if the student is not there, but the student is, of course, there. And I'm saying, look, you're going to get to see the reactions of a reader to your writing. So you'll see if I'm confused, you'll see when I'm understanding something, you'll see when I like something, you'll see what works, what doesn't work, you'll see ambiguities, you will get to see the reactions of a reader. And I will make written notes on the paper. You can also take notes on your own sheet, or I may stop it at any point and say, do you want to write anything down? Do you want to write in your words how to uh, rephrase this? So instead of me doing the comments, they're writing their own comments, and I can see what it is that they are understanding and learning and taking from, from my comments. And uh, at the end, I do let them have that paper. They get to keep the paper with all of those written comments on there. Actually, I never want to see it again in my life, but uh, they walk out with it, and then you know I would do a rewrite or the next paper. At the end of that, I do assign a grade or what I actually move to is the points. Uh, uh, the first paper may be 25 points, second 35, 45, 55 points, whatever it is, and a certain number of points uh, based on the, the rubric, based on what I'm looking for uh, in, the, in the paper. I've never had a great challenge. I've never had a disappointed uh, student, and students understand exactly what grade they're getting and why, and it's been a really interesting process of interactive learning because I can see that the students really know uh, what the, what's happening when we're doing this live grading. And I my my slides are not advancing. Mark, just give it another click. Sometimes. So, sometimes there you there, there you, you go. go. Sometimes it takes a click or two. Thank you. Um, some of the benefits of doing live grading is that it actually combines the time I spend grading with the time I spend in paper conferences. Before I would spend uh, two to three weeks grading 25, 35 papers, whatever it was. Now I can do in two to three days, and it's an amazing amount of efficiency for me to be able to, to do that. I don't cancel any of my classes. I make time for these paper conferences and and the students come in and we we do them. I may do uh, uh, five, six, eight in a day, but I can get through them uh, usually within a week, sometimes uh, much faster than that. Uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, benefit to have a, a lot of extra time uh, in the in the classroom and in my, in, my, in my life, I'm able to focus more on teaching additional research skills and other things that I want to do in the class. When I'm giving these comments, I can see whether the student understands. I can see whether the student is sharing that understanding. Uh, Allison was saying that she would read out a paragraph or a sentence to, to the student and, and see that this student uh, will see that she's not understanding something. Sometimes I'll have the student read that sentence or paragraph, and the student will, on their own, see that there's some problem with that and figure out how to fix it. With the written paper, sometimes I will take the written paper and turn it upside down and have them write a new sentence without looking at what they wrote before on the back of the paper, and that's also another really good technique that I've found. Uh, students really like getting quick feedback on their papers. Um, they've written them. They're used to instant everything. 
They don't want to wait two weeks for their, their grades and their comments. They're, they're moving on. They really appreciate seeing the, the actual reactions of readers. They understand that when they are going to be in a law firm or presenting a, a brief or motion to a judge that there's a real person reading this and that they have to be aware of that, that reader expectation. And uh, I let them ask questions along the way or um, actually uh, explain their reasoning if, or on particular points that might uh, be eluding me uh, during the paper, during the, the conference. My, my view is that students learn more and retain more from the live grading experience. This is a good experience. They see what's important in legal writing. They see that everything matters, that it all works together, that every part of the memo is important, that it has a function, that it's a useful document, and I believe that this is a really good teaching tool. There are some fears and limitations that people have about using live critiquing and live grading. And I just want to go through some of those now. One is a fear that students won't like this technique. They'll be afraid of it. They'll think it's weird. They, they are not used to going in and having someone read their paper in front of them. Um, I felt this way very early on when I was doing this. And, and uh, said, oh, I'm just going to do this on a limited basis and, and just did it on rewrites to start. So I know that those papers would be pretty good. A lot of the problems would be solved. It would be easier for me because I'd be very familiar with the documents already. But this, I found that, that students really loved the live grading technique. And they wanted it on all the papers. I do traditional grading still on the very first draft. But after that, I do live grading on all of the papers. Sometimes, maybe not the last one, it depends on when we end in the semester and when their final exams are. Uh, it's just a matter of scheduling or not. But uh, for all of the papers, I try and do the live grading. Students really love it. That was my impression, and I wanted to check that. So I had one of my research assistants go and interview um, students who had taken my class and who had experienced live grading. And we did this in 2008. Uh, for the popcorn session I did in, in Indianapolis at the LWI meeting there. And the, yeah, you can see those, um, those answers at the SSRN uh, link there uh, with students saying that they really enjoyed it, that they learned a lot from it, that they wanted it on all their papers. They might have been a little bit ambivalent at the beginning, but they really enjoyed the learning process and they wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, it was a great insight for me and a bit of a confirmation that this was a great uh, tool and a great thing to, to keep doing. Another fear is that when you're reading the papers live and commenting or grading on them, that you won't know all of the cases that are being cited. So uh, to combat that, you can look through the papers in advance. You can just see what cases they've cited. You can read those cases, uh, be sure that they're cited correctly, that the quotations are correct. You can do that in advance. Uh, all of the live grading doesn't mean everything has to be live graded. You can do a little bit uh, in advance, especially with its, if it's material or cases that you might not be familiar with. Another fear is that you might just run into something completely unexpected while you're doing the live grading. And I think there's two things you can do uh, in that situation. One is that you, you just say, hey, I wasn't expecting to see that. Or, and you can uh, take a mi minute to figure that out. Or you can uh, say, let me think about this for a while. Uh, you don't always have to assign the grading in a live grading thing. You can say, let, um, this is a, a different situation. I want to think about this. I want to look at this and figure it out. Um, other situations that you might run into is maybe you see some, some possible plagiarism. Uh, you can uh, then also uh, take time to investigate that before you assign a final grade. Now, there's also some uh, limitations which are pretty real uh, about uh, live grading. Uh, when you have to grade on a mandatory curve, that makes it really hard to do the live grading because you're never sure how it's going to play out on the curve. But you can still use the live critiquing part of it. Uh, you could even assign tentative grades. You could even uh, assign them without uh, telling the students. You could just take a little notes on, to yourself about what grade you're going to give to this paper while you're doing the live critiquing. And then you go back later and you, all, you don't have to reread it. You already have your own notes about it. Uh, or you can use live grading on at least one assignment. Maybe you have three, four 
five assignments during the semester, you could use live grading on at least one assignment or at least part of an assignment, and that will save you some time, hopefully. Another limitation on live grading is when you have to grade your students anonymously. You uh, could have them put a paper bag over their head uh, to come in and do the grading, but that's not going to be uh, comfortable for anybody. So uh, it's not really possible to do live grading if this, if the, uh, if it has to be anonymous. But maybe you can still use uh, the technique, critiquing or grading on part of, a, of an assignment uh, in some way. Again. Uh, the process is just that the student comes in, you read the paper in front of the student, the students get to see the reactions. I'm making comments, the students are making comments. It's an interactive learning process where everyone is together. And at the end of it, what I do is assign the, the, the greater points at the end of the grading session, and I'm done with that, and my grading is done then in two or three days. It's an amazing process that has worked really well and has really changed how I am teaching legal writing and it has improved the learning of my students. I think we're ready for more of your questions from the audience now. Great. Well, we have quite a few of them, and so I'm, I'm going to try to take it as many as I can in the next five or five or eight minutes here and give them to you. Um, the first one is about, uh, I believe it comes from Colleen, and she's asking about uh, prioritizing, that how do you prioritize uh, your, your comments um, it, when you're in that live grading or live critiquing session, you know how do you how do you decide what's going to be talked about uh, if you can't talk about everything? And and Jason, maybe I'll start with you on that one. Sure. Um, yeah, it's a really good question, Colleen, and that's why I um, I, I start off by asking my students what they thought of the you know of the of the assignment, and and I try to probe a little bit in the first couple of minutes as to where they thought things were going going well and maybe where things weren't going so well. And then I try, as we're reading through things, to focus in on those points because often the students are pretty intuitive about where they're struggling and they may not know the right words or the right terms to express it, but you know, if someone's saying, well, I really couldn't quite figure out how to put my, you know, my cases in where they belonged, they're talking about structure issues and eventually as we go through the memo, I can see that there are clear structure issues. So we talk about how to draft those case explanations and those analyses in the in a way that will convey a proper organization and a structure. Um, so I kind of um, and each conference is different. That's the other thing. If you're doing the the live critiquing, you know, when you're sitting and commenting, going through the papers, you tend to be writing the same comments over and over again. I find that no conference is like any other conference. Everyone has its own unique personality based on what the student, where the student is. Some students get it right away, so those conferences are more um, elevated. We go into more in depth and in trying to be more sophisticated in the writing. Some conferences, students are still struggling with basic concept so I'm really backing up and starting from square one so it it really is guided quite a bit by how the student presents him or herself when they sit down at the table with me Kirsten great yes sorry looking for the right thing to click um, <laughs> that's okay <laughs> Allison and Mark do you have anything you want to add about about prioritizing um, I would just say that because I do this on all rough drafts, my rubric sort of informs them what we're going to really focus on, and I tell them that ahead of time. So like Jason, I spend most of my time on analysis, large-scale organization, um, CREAC, that kind of thing. But I will. So it, it gives me an opportunity to take one paragraph if they're having a lot of writing difficulties and say, let's look at the sentence-level issues in this one paragraph. Um, and it gives us a chance to rewrite some things, too. So I think I, I tell them always that on a, on a very first rough draft, we're really focusing on analysis and overall organization and not so much on grammar and citation and sentence structure and those things. But again, um, as Jason said, if, if the draft is better, we can look at some of those other things as well. Great. And, and I'll just add my two cents before going to Mark. Um, when I use this method, I often have my teaching assistant give some um, written feedback that I, of course, look over uh, on citation, for example. And then students do get that feedback as well, but I don't have to focus on it in the session. Um, Mark, do you have anything to add? Or I can ask you the next question, which is really directed. I, I, think, I, I think my reactions are pretty similar to Jason and Allison's. 
Good. Well, then I'll leave the line open for you because we've gotten lots of questions on grading and students um, who argue uh, about grades. Uh, and and I, I can't really find the, um, oh, here, here's one uh, from Elizabeth. Uh, do you ever have to give a failing grade while you're live grading and how do you handle it? And then others have asked whether you ever get into a student who wants to argue with you about the grade you're getting and giving and how do you handle that? Okay, I've never had an argument about the grade. The student sees exactly what I'm doing. They see exactly what I'm looking at. They know that that would be the same in a law firm or before a judge. So I've never had an argument about a grade. They, they, they see exactly what I'm doing. And yes, I have had to give failing grades on uh, the live grading uh, from time to time. Uh, thankfully, this doesn't happen so often, but it does happen. But the student knows exactly what they did and exactly why they got a failing grade on that paper. And the amazing thing is that does more to kick them and turn it around so well. I, they work so hard on the next one. They will use our writing center with uh, Lorraine Contento and, and her colleagues. They will uh, show me more drafts before the next one. They will really uh, get, uh, get into it and turn in a, a great next paper when they've had that bad experience. They, they never want to be in that situation again where they, they've uh, cited the case that's been overruled, when they've forgotten some facts, when they've um, forgotten to proofread or uh, any kinds of things. There's all kinds of reasons that would bring a paper down, but they just get turned around and, and that's why I'm, I'm such a, a great believer in the power of this, uh, this technique to really make students learn and to become excellent writers. Um, great. And, and relatedly, uh, Delith asks, uh, how do you account for students feeling you are stopped from assigning them a bad grade later when you told them about what they needed to do while live grading? And I think this goes more toward maybe Allison and Jason um, on the question of sort of when this is a, a first draft of something and then students have to rewrite it, do you ever run into the problem of, well, you didn't tell me this or you told me something different in the live grading session? Uh, well, I have actually I haven't run into that problem because, like I said, I try to cover. I also use a rubric like like Allison, and so they do know, and I give them competencies with the assignment when we first start off, and I tell them what I'm looking for in the competencies for the assignment, and then use the rubric um, on the on the back side of those competencies, so they know what I'm looking for um, when we sit and talk, and 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 it's also clear that we have not touched upon everything. I tell them I'm not covering citation. I give them a separate um, a written comments on citation that I do separately so they have that. And we don't really talk about grammar unless I see a glaring error, like they, they have a paragraph that goes on for 23 sentences, which I actually did have this, this last week where the student actually sat down and I said, you know, what's the problem? We looked at the paragraph and he started counting the sentences because he wanted to tell me that if it was less than 23 sentences, it was okay and it wasn't too long of a paragraph. So we then got to a conversation of what's the purpose of a paragraph. Um, but I, I do give then written comments on the rewrite, which incorporates what they did for the first draft. So they do have written comments also. So hopefully the comments are building on each other. And I haven't had a situation where students come back and say, well, you never told me that I shouldn't do this or I should have done this and therefore you know, I feel like I've been disadvantaged. I've never had that problem either. Um, I do make a note right on the bottom of my rubric, and I tell them in class, there's no way even in 45 minutes to an hour that I can comment on every possible thing in their entire paper. So just because I don't comment on something doesn't mean it's perfect, um, but I've never had them challenge me. Um, Jason, we just had a quick follow-up question. Can you just explain quickly what you mean by competencies that you hand out in front? Of the of the of the live great live critiquing session. Sure. sure, absolutely. So when I give the first when I give my assignments, uh, any written assignment, I tell them exactly what um, what they're going to be accomplishing in this assignment. So for instance, I may say, you know, uh, 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 competently draft uh, rule synthesis. Uh, use multiple case authorities to um, detail. Uh, the rule of law, um, effectively anal analogize and distinguish case law from facts. So um, it's usually in an assignment I have seven or eight or nine competencies objectives for that assignment that's clear and then, um, you know, and there'll be, you know, uh, 
standard ones, you know, uh, uses all proper Allwood citations. We use the Allwood manual. Use proper Allwood citation. Um, properly uses punctuation, grammar, you know, proofreads documents, some of those things. And then my rubric um, tracks those competencies, those objectives. Um, to show them how they've ex how, where they are in meeting those objectives, whether they are beginning, developed, proficient, accomplished. That's how I break up my rubric to show them where they are in meeting those objectives, those competencies. Great, that helpful. Yeah, I, I think that explains it. Thanks. Um, we did have a couple questions about whether you incorporate any kind of uh, obligation on the student to do any sort of prep for the session themselves, whether it's some sort of written prep um, or any kind of writer's reflection memo uh, in, in conjunction with this. And I'll just throw that out to all of you if you have any thoughts on that. I have not done that. I think it's a good idea. Um, and I've thought about doing it. I, I don't require it particularly for the first one because my students are usually pretty nervous coming in for the very first time to sit next to me and go over their writing, which they're pretty um, you know, defensive about anyway, um, because it feels so personal. I, so I have not, but I think it would be a good idea. I used to ask them to bring three questions with them that they want to discuss um, during the, the scope of the conference. And, I, and uh, what I'd find is some of them would, some of them wouldn't, some of them wouldn't really have thought. They'd scratch them out of the paper right before they walked in. So I think the better approach is when they sit down, to, to push them a little bit, say, how you know, what do you think of the assignment? What how do you think you did? What did you like about it? Something like that, that then develops those three questions or those three things you want to talk about. Um, I've given them reflection, author reflections after the conferences to talk about what they want to work on and improving towards the next writing assignment. I didn't do that this time because I often find that comes out during the conference, and what happens is I basically what they do is they write on paper what we just talked about in the conference. I don't give them any extra work for the conference because they have just handed their papers in a, a day or two before. I'm able to get most of these papers uh, graded the same week that they turn them in. Uh, so it's limited to the need to have an extra assignment. Um, this is Kirsten, and I'll just throw in one thing that I've sometimes done is um, when they hand in their paper, then that same day when they come to class, I give them a, sort of a reflection piece that asks them about their process. Uh, how many drafts did you write? When did you get it done? When did you start researching? And they turn that in. And, and sometimes if I've got a student who's really struggling when they come to the live conference, we can talk about that process. And oftentimes their answers to questions about when they started or how many drafts they wrote or what they thought were the most problematic areas often give us some ways to address the, the issues that they're having uh, without, without me having to ask a lot of questions. You know, they've already answered some of those for me. So that sometimes works. Um, and then I think this will probably be our final question because we are, we are I think, now, yes, uh, just right at our time to conclude. Uh, but someone asked whether you record the conferences um, and so that students can use it later. Um, and if so, how do you, how do, you do that? I do not, though I've had some of my students come with recording devices on their computers and ask me if they could record it, and I've always allowed that. I, I've had the same situation. I do not record them, and this last week was the first time I actually had a student walk in with his iPhone and say, uh, do you mind if I record this as we're talking? And it took me aback for a second because I had never even really contemplated uh, I had thought about whether I'd want to record them, and I decided I didn't. And then, but I don't know why I never thought about a student asking me to for permission to record them. Um, and I did the same thing. Allison. I said, "Sure, if you want to record this." He said, "It's just easier for him. He can go back and listen to what we talked about in addition to his written notes." So I did let the student record that that conference. Um, I I don't uh, do that. Of course, I would make an exception for uh, situations with disabilities and other uh, special situations. Uh, just because uh, I want them to learn how to listen and, and be sure that they understand everything. The, in a law firm, they're not going to be able to record the partner going over the, the memo with them, and they wouldn't want to do that. I go slowly through the, the memo, and I, I won't move on until I'm sure that the student has understood the point that we are covering, um, either with my notes or their own notes. So hopefully they are learning how to do that without the need for going over it a second time in the recording. They can always come back and ask questions later, too, though. Great. 
Well, I think this has been a really super uh, session, and I appreciate the panelists uh, sharing their time with us uh, today in what are some very busy conditions that I know lots of people are right in the throes of that mid-semester grading. And thank you, all of you, for joining us. Nearly 40 of you joined us today, and, and feel free to refer your colleagues to, uh, to the recorded session. As you leave today, you'll be asked a couple of questions about how you like this uh, webinar and uh, if you have any ideas for us for future ones. But that does it for us here. Thank you again to Allison, Jason, and, and Mark for doing a wonderful session today. And, and we look forward to having you join us again. And everyone have a, a great day out there uh, doing lots of commenting and critiquing, however you do it. Thanks again. Panelists, I'm going to uh, log us off right now. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. You're welcome.